Welcome back, everyone. We have several exciting sessions this afternoon. Uh, the floor will be open until 5 p.m. tonight, so we'll be uh, in conference sessions here from 1 to 3. I'm going to do everything to make sure we stay as on time as possible. All of our speakers will be available afterwards if you do have additional questions for them. Great questions this morning, so we're going to try and keep it right on 3 o'clock so you guys have additional time on the floor. So first up, getting things started, we have Mr. Chip Forsyth. Chip is a cannabis winemaker and founder of Rebel Coast Winery. Rebel Coast is the first winery in the world to legally make marijuana-infused alcohol removed Sauvignon Blanc. Chip has been working on this for a very long time and is so proud to have it out in the market at over 100 dispensaries. Today, he'll be speaking with all of us about getting high, not stoned. So let's welcome Mr. Chip Forsyth. No stairs on that side, Chip, yeah, sorry. No worries, sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, for you. Okay. Here you are. So my name is Chip Forsyth. I'm gonna just sit down. Um, so I've been making traditional wine for the last 15 years. And about uh, two years ago, we decided to see what would happen if you removed just the alcohol molecule from wine and replaced it with a THC molecule. And it took a ton of R&D, years of work, tasted like garbage at first. Uh, alcohol removed wine tastes pretty bad to begin with. Um, so now I'm kind of here to answer any questions you guys have. Um, I, how, how many of you guys are here from California or from out of state? Or California, I guess, raise your hands. So the rest of you guys are out of state? Awesome, okay. Um, I'll kind of just give you a little bit of the information that we've learned over the last year. Um, I can only speak for California laws, California regulations, and the California market, um, mainly Southern California. These are my two traditional wines. Um, they don't have alcohol in it, and it really helped us build the brand recognition uh, when we did go to dispensaries. They're for sale all over the country. We sell a couple hundred thousand bottles a month um, throughout, throughout California and the rest of the United States. Let's see what I can do. This is what we became pretty well known for. Um, and, and our marketing kind of, we wanted to play off of that um, on what we're doing. When we first went to market, we thought that a cannabis wine, like a weed wine, should smell like weed and taste like wine. Um, we did tons of R&D, introduced terpenes to the wine, gave it out to about 1,000 people to see what they wanted, and nobody liked it. So we, we learned real fast. One of the things we learned a lot of is, is try everything before you get to market for it. Because once you're in market and you've got your packaging done and your manufacturing done, it's really, really hard to do that again. Um, we went to market first with a really low dose thing. And when we started doing this talk, and when we were invited to come here, the idea was we were five milligrams a glass. And we went to market trying to mimic a glass of wine. You know, like a glass of wine will get you a buzz, but it won't get you drunk. And we wanted to do the same thing with a cannabis infused wine where it would get you high, but not stoned. Um, so we went out five milligrams a glass. We were in about 50 dispensaries. And what we wanted to do is collect as much data as we could on why, what's causing people to repeat the purchase or what's causing them not to. Um, huge, huge, huge feedback from every single dispensary we were in was that five milligrams a glass is not enough. And I fought that for a while. I was like, look, I don't, if we make it 10 milligrams a glass, it's fast acting. Oh shit. It's fast acting, uh, um, it's fast acting THC. So when THC is liquid soluble, like a 10 milligram glass of our wine, cause we upped the dosage, 10 milligram glass of the wine hits you in 15 minutes and it's not equal to a 10 milligram gummy bear or an edible, like a chocolate. And that was, that is still a huge thing that, this, that not very many people know about. So customer education has been a really, really big uh, hurdle for us. We spend a lot of time and energy on educating people that five milligrams of a liquid soluble THC is completely different than five milligrams of a edible like a gummy bear or anything like that. Um, that's why I wanted to keep it really, really low dosage to begin with uh, because 10 milligrams, you would drink it and you'd, you'd get stoned. Um, so we didn't, we didn't go to market with that, listen to every dispensary, everybody wanted it stronger and cheaper. So we lowered the price. Originally, it was out the door at $90 a bottle. It's real expensive to make. You have to make the wine first, then remove the alcohol, then infuse it with THC in a different facility because uh, cannabis and alcohol can't be under the same roof or in the same, for sale in the same location. 
Um, so we went to market $90 a bottle. We figured it'd be an easy sell. We're the only people in the world doing it, no competition. Um, it sold, but not as fast as we wanted to. So we dropped it down to 40 milligrams a bottle and then upped the THC to 40 milligrams. So it's 40 milligrams for $40. That's the game plan. Um, it, it, when we were doing this talk, it was like get high, not stoned. People that are going into dispensaries are not there to just get high. Like that is something we learned. It took us six months of selling through the inventory we had and then finally getting to a spot where we can make more, well, it took maybe three months, where we can make more up the dosage and sell it because we're listening to every dispensary owner. We have an in-house, <laughs> We have an in-house sales team. Um, we don't use a distribution company because we wanted to get feedback for the first two years. Um, walking into each dispensary being like, why is it selling? Why isn't it selling? What do people like about it? What do people don't not like about it? How does the packaging reflect with people? Um, so we got tons of feedback from them. Every dispensary owner is like, make it stronger. They weren't even worried about the price when it was $90 a bottle. They're just like, make it stronger. People are in here buying, um, that, there's kind of like an old adage, like when prohibition for alcohol was going on, uh, the most valuable, most expensive part of alcohol you could buy was a moon moonshine out of a mason jar. It was like 120 proof, just rocket fuel. Uh, people have been buying cannabis on the black market, whatever, from your drug dealer, whatever. Uh, everybody's always saying, this is the strongest stuff. This is the best stuff. This is the highest potency. This is going to really do it for you. Um, and we kind of ignored that when we went to dispensaries, thinking it was going to be a different customer. Um, but it's not. There, there's People are still buying on price per milligram for the foreseeable future, I think, in the next year and a half, two years, it's going to completely change. This whole industry is going to change once all the black market dispensaries are going to hopefully get shut down. A lot of them are getting shut down constantly. Um, but as the black market goes away and people are more forced into the, uh, the legal dispensaries, uh, people are going to be educated more and more on what's going on. Um, should I do questions now? Do you guys have any questions about all, kind of all that stuff? Yeah, fire off. Yes. Does that mean it just it doesn't like an edible kind of processes to deliver? Yes. And it sticks with you for hours. Is this closer to like hitting a joint, like hits you fast and ah, goes fast? I wish it was I wish it was that fast. Um, for liquid soluble technology right now, uh, it's taking about like ten to fifteen minutes before you can feel it. Um, that depends on person's height, weight, body type, full stomach, empty stomach, guy, girl, um, and then tolerance. Tolerance is something that's really under-researched in this industry. Like, people know that, you know, if you have a friend that consumes daily or week, you know, all the time, a couple times a day, uh, their tolerance is way higher. They always say stuff like, oh, I, I, 40 milligrams of chocolate, I can barely feel it, or a 100 milligram chocolate bar, I can barely feel it. Like, that's a real thing. There's no data on how fast your tolerance gets built up or anything like that. Um, for liquid soluble stuff, either if you do nano emulsification or if you coat the THC molecule um, in a surfactant, it'll usually be absorbed sublingually in your mouth first, and then as it goes down, and then through the walls of your stomach. Um, there's lipid soluble technology, if anybody here does lipid soluble technology or is considering it. It's, it's really old school stuff. It's where the THC molecule is attached to a fat molecule, like butter or cooking oil, like a lot of edibles are done like that. That'll take, it has to go through your whole digestive tract. Um, the nano emulsification, and if it's coated in a hydrophobic, hydrophilic surfactant, it goes through the walls of your stomach. So it, it's going a lot faster, but combustible is still the fastest way, I think, to do it. Um, yeah. Is there any other questions about that? Well, then what about to follow up on his question? Yeah. The back end of that, right? How down or how long? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah like, so his question so was how fast does it take to feel it, and then how fast does it take to come down? Edibles, gummy bears, chocolates, and stuff like that are usually taking an hour to an hour and a half before you feel intoxicated, and then they last, depends on how much you consume, but five to 
eight hours, you know, like everybody's had one too many brownies and your whole day's shot. So, um, but with liquid soluble technology, it, it's a faster onset and a faster offset. So it's usually lasting, and it, if, you can, if you drink a bottle of this stuff, you're gonna be high for six, seven hours. If you just drink, a, or you'll be stoned for six or seven hours. If you drink a glass of it, you'll be high or, or like borderline stoned for two to three hours. So it is a faster onset, faster offset. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, where did we land on per glass? So we started at five, then we just bumped it up to 10. And I dispensaries are still saying it's too, it needs to be stronger. Because we can go up to, in a glass, or in a bottle of wine, there's four glasses. And you can go up to 100 milligrams in there. So we can do 25 milligrams of liquid soluble THC in each glass. And that will, I won't do that. Like that's really, really that's unenjoyable at that point. Like if you want to get really stoned, you can just take a dab. You can just rip on a vape pen for a little bit. Um, that's not what we're trying to do on this. Like this is a social thing. There's four glasses in there. Hopefully it's a, it's a real social enjoyment where you can share it with people and still be able to function and talk. Um, people are, or dispensary owners are still asking for stronger stuff because they don't understand, not that they're not intelligent, they just, there's not very many beverage, cannabis beverages out there. And the ones that are out there, they. They use different technologies, they taste funny, they're whatever. Um, so customer education, teaching each dispensary what's going on and training their bud tender staff and doing customer appreciation days where we do wine tastings at each one of their dispensaries once a week for four weeks in a row as soon as we get into their store um, is invaluable because if not, they'll purchase something that they've never had, they've never tried, they don't know what it is, they don't know anything about it, it'll sit on the shelves, they'll never sell it, and then they won't purchase again. So, yeah. You guys, we're gonna take this back to grade school, we're gonna raise hands and yeah. come around with a mic. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, you're fine. Yeah. Uh, Lawani and I will be managing, we have a question right here, so keep your hands raised if you have them, we're gonna make a little order, so. Perfect. So ed edibles are almost always sold in 100 milligrams per package, and the dose can be different, two and a half, yeah. five, ten. Um, do you find that consumers are doing the dollars per milligram math in, um, on your product and in beverages in general, and kind of like seeing that there's maybe a mismatch in how much THC they're getting for um, the dollars they spend? And how do you think about that? 100%. And instead of fighting it and just trying to change California's cannabis consuming public's idea that ours is faster acting, stronger, whatever. Um, we just went with it, so we raised the milligrams and dropped the price. So $40 for 40 milligrams is pretty on par with edibles. Um, but yeah, it, price per milligram is a very, you have to pay attention to that because I, uh, this is super innovative product. It's great, no one has ever done it. Nobody still can do it because it's hard. We thought price wouldn't matter, and it absolutely does. People still shop with their wallets. Yeah. We have a question over here. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a drinks industry show. Mm -hmm. um, what does your customer's uh, feedback say about, are they going for the high or are they going for the drink? That's the high. A good tasting drink, so they don't yeah. care what it tastes like? You said something Ooh. about, but well, that's kind yeah. of what I'm, the question is. Yeah is where this industry going is, is like a great tasting wine that just happens to get you high or you get high yeah. and it tastes like crap or, you know. Where, where do you think this is shaking out? So our biggest thing, the reason we started was, I was so sick, I've been a winemaker forever and so sick of being hung over. Um, if it doesn't taste good, people will buy something once, they'll try it if the packaging's good. You know, it's weed wine, whatever, $40, I'll give it a shot. Um, if it doesn't taste good, then they're not gonna buy it again. Uh, we spent a lot of time to make it taste and smell like wine, and our biggest um, critics are actually sommeliers, wines, self-proclaimed wine snobs and stuff like that, and the easiest sell we have is to someone who's like, yeah, I'll try it, like I've had wine before. Um, they drink it, they're like, it's delicious, and then you're like, oh yeah, it has like, then, then you can do your sales pitch, like, oh, there's only 35 calories in each glass because there's no alcohol, um, you'll never be hung over, you'll be able to still be social and talk, but yeah, it has to taste good to get your second purchase if the marketing gets the first purchase done, and the price. Chip, we had one over here. Oh yeah. How's it going? Great. 
Are you looking to expand outside of California, like maybe up into Washington or working with any other wineries with what you're doing? Originally, yes. Like 2018, when we first started, we got funded. Our goal was to cover as many legal states as possible. Um, 2018 was a really rough year for cannabis regulations in California. And then trying to ex expand to be a multi-state operator, you need a ton of cash because you can't, cannabis can't cross state lines. You can make it in California, it stays in California. So we'd have to build a cannabis winery in Oregon, Washington, Canada. We were pretty interested in Canada for a while. And then you have to navigate each one of those states' cannabis laws, which are still being written. Well, Washington and Oregon are kind of solidified, but uh, like Colorado's more solidified too. But any of the East Coast states, all those laws are still being written and rewritten, and it's really hard to navigate. You need an incredible amount of cash like in millions of dollars if you want to launch into another state from whatever state you're in. Like you've got your home base, you know how to sell to those people, but you have to clone your company, sales team, distribution team, logistics team, compliance team. You have to build those in Colorado or Canada or whatever state you're going into. So as of right now, California is the largest market. There's no reason to leave. Weed and wine, we make 95% of the U.S.'s wine, I don't know what percent of the cannabis because there's still the black market, um, but it's a great area for us to start for our product. Um, everyone's different though. But going into multiple states, make sure you've got lots of funding in the bank. Yeah. We have a sort of cluster of questions. We have, so we're yeah. gonna do three right here and then you'll be in the back for a little bit if people have additional ones. In yeah, yeah, I'll be right over here. I'm here to like answer your questions. This took, it sounds super easy. Oh, and I. Do you guys want to hear about like the marketing side of stuff or the advertising? Okay. Yes, Maybe. we got lots okay, of guesses. Okay, cool. I'll just hit on this. Okay. Um, I've got four minutes left. Okay. So n knowing your audience is super important. We've spent a lot of time, and these pictures are whatever, just look at like the average likes on it. Um, this is on Instagram. We stay away from Facebook because we have 10,000 followers on Facebook, whatever. We post something and five people see it. Facebook is absolutely a pay to play thing. Instagram is going that way, but as of the last two years, you can post something and the people that organically follow you um, can stay with it. So knowing the audience, like, okay, the, the three things for our brand that really work are me, pretty girl, bottle of wine, and, and a candid photo, something like that. And we'll get hundreds and hundreds of likes per stuff. If we do anything with cannabis, because we have a huge cannabis following, like the weed leaves in there, well, thousands of people see it. Um, hashtags, I know it sounds nerdy, they're incredibly important. You can take the coolest video, coolest photo on Instagram, put it up, and it could be beautiful picture of wine at a vineyard, whatever, anything like that. Nobody will see it. You've got 31 hashtags that you can use. That's how people, basically how people Google stuff on Instagram. So absolutely use those. So this is a video, it's, it's just a funny video of us opening a bottle with a fidget spinner, no big deal. This is the one that got like 65,000 views. It's me unrolling wine labels with a drill. It's incredibly boring, but it had the right hashtags. Instagram picked it up, it put it on their search page, and in 24 hours, 60,000 people watched me do something absolutely pointless. Um, and it's all because of hashtags. Like, it's, it's, it's it. Um, print versus TV. Uh, the Associated Press picked us up twice. Um, mainly because weed and wine are very clickable titles. Like everybody knows somebody that'll like one or two of those things. So we had three or 4,000 articles come out about us in the six months. There's about, it was an article a day, maybe two, and now it's probably one article a week unsolicited that's coming out. Um, but it goes to, it's, it's about the product. Like weed, wine, it's innovative. It's the first in the world to do it. So that's really, really important. This isn't emulatable very often. Um, but print versus TV, if you can get in front of a camera, your reach is 10, 20x. Like we'll have millions and millions and millions of people will watch us on TV with these rappers, um, on TV shows, on USA Today. If you can ever get in front of a camera versus writing an article, like some, some guy will send you questions to answer and you just talk about what's going on. Um, you, TV's way, way, way more important. Um, the reach is far, oh, it's freaking great. 
Um, that's it. That, that's kind of all. I know that's super brief. Do you guys have any other questions? Or we what have, other questions do you have? We have this have? little cluster of three, and then everyone oh, yeah. else will be individual. Here we go. <laughs> Did you say it was $90 a bottle? Oh, I can't. Did you say it was $90 a bottle? Uh, yeah, the... It was Nike versus what? No, did he say it was $90 a bottle? Oh, out the door? Yeah, at a dispensary. So we would wholesale it at 35, they'd mark it up to 65, and some people would mark it up to 75, and then there's the tax. The can this is for legal dispensaries. We didn't mess with the black market stuff because I'm glad we didn't. But yeah, out the door it was 90. So then we lowered the price down to 40 and up to the milligrams to 40. Got yeah. it, thank you. We were just seeing, we were like, yeah, if people buy it, like it's more money in our pocket. Yeah. And for the the wine, this was a sulfite based fermentation. Um, no, you just do yeast. I mean, you don't really add too much sulfur while you're fermenting it. So, and then that didn't kind of muddle up as far as with the terpenes uh, initially interacting with it. No, because you, you, the sulfur is all burnt off. If there, you, you'll you'll just you don't add sulfur until you're the final day of bottling when you're kind of like Bottle as a preservative sure. it's only like third 25 parts per million so we haven't had any issues with that um, I don't know if it's because it was low sulfur or anything like that I haven't done any bench trials for it because I haven't had a problem with that and what yeast are you pitching oh I have no idea we just <laughs> I yeah just old yeast doesn't matter as much as um, the as it because it's once the alcohol stripped out all those nuances to make a really good glass of wine where someone does huge sensory evaluation on it when you remove the alcohol and then put in a thc molecule it changes the taste so my main goal as a winemaker is to cover up the bitterness of the thc yeah. carbonation is also a great way to do that if anybody's thinking about that carbonation covers up a lot of undesirable flavors we have hey, one last question. Yeah. Great talk. Hi. Thanks. My name's Alana. Um, two questions, quickly. Um, I just want to ask, number one, um, where is your distribution? Uh, In-house. In so house. we use, yeah, is that the first? Yep. Yeah. So for us, selling to dispensaries, we, we partnered up with three different distributors, cannabis distributors. They promised the, the whole world to us. We're going to get you in 100 doors. We've got a sales team of 40 people, no, I mean not 40, 20 people. We're going to do all this stuff. All these cannabis distributors fell short of their promises, and it was our revenue that was suffering. So I was like, screw this. We're going to just, it's cost more. We're going to hire our own sales team. We use this great company called Blackbird to deliver. They just pick up the product from our warehouse, store it in their warehouse, and fulfill orders. And our sales team just sends them an email or uses their app and they're like, hey, so-and-so needs 10 cases, deliver it to X, Y, and Z. And they handle all the logistics, the tax, the quarantine, the testing, everything like that. Yeah. And um, where can I find you in Northern California? In Northern California, so we're adding a bunch of dispensaries every day. If you just Google Rebel Coast or Weed Wine, our website has a store locator on it, so it should have it. But like uh, off the top of my head, Harborside Sparks, Urban Farm, those are the three my favorite ones. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chip. Chip yeah. will be in the back if you have additional questions and also on the floor, which is open till five. Yeah. Thank you, Chip. Yeah.